Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company. Once again, I have a cold, so uh, forgive me if I choke occasionally. Um, what I want to speak to you tonight about is regarding Ron Paul, Mitt Romney, Barack Obama, and the other presidential contenders. Particularly, I asked the Iowa and New Hampshire voters to concentrate on this question. Why is Ron Paul better or worse than Romney or Obama? Well, let's face it. Now, let me preface that in the past, I've carefully researched, footnoted, and documented with double referencing all of the statistical claims that I made. If you want to research the statistical claims I'm going to make tonight, go to my last video on SB 1867 or my website, microtopia.org, and you will find spreadsheets, references, and so forth. Tonight I'm just going to speak to the core issues. <clears throat> we are in serious trouble as a nation, the United States of America. We, on the foreign policy side, we are acting arrogantly and like the masters of the new economies that will overtake the world. The new economies that will overtake the world, the ones that are best known, are Brazil, Russia, India, and China. They're not the only ones. We need to understand what Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which I will refer to from now on as BRIC, will do to our grandchildren. And that the longer we take our military superiority as a measure of how we're doing against BRIC, uh, the more dangerous this will become. The worse the consequences will be for your children and your grandchildren. Because no empire has ever sustained a military advantage when their underlying economic capabilities were buckling. You cannot have the strongest army in the world for more than a few decades at most if you don't have the economy to drive it. Any intelligent person understands that fundamentally in their gut. Last week, Brazil overtook the United Kingdom as the seventh largest economy in the world. Soon, no European country will, or Japan will outstrip the BRIC countries, the newly developing and emerging economies. The United States is, the trends show that we are on our way to becoming a third world police state. So why is Ron Paul uh, the person we need to elect versus Romney or Obama? Why do I believe that? Well, first of all, since this election started, it was clear to me that the powers that be were setting up a stage where Romney and Obama would face off. I don't think it really matters much which wins, because if you look at Obama's policies and Bush's policies, at the end of the day, there's not a great deal of difference. That's very hard for liberals to understand, even in my own family, but that's a fact. If you look at Obama's hawkishness since he became elected on the international stage, if you look at the ineffectiveness of his ability to put forward new efficient and effective policies, the same power structures will be perpetuated under Romney or Obama. One. Two. Our country is rife with corruption. Hence, I say, current trend lines show we're heading towards becoming a third world country, a big third world country. But we're heading in the opposite direction of Brazil, Russia, and India and China. We're heading towards what they were. And they're heading towards what we were. Ron Paul is the only candidate who's willing to take on this mass corruption. When the government is rotting, you have to gut it. You have to rebuild it. And you have to uh, find the resources in your local community to repair the damage that's occurred to your schools, to your health clinics, to your parks, to your swimming pools, to your population that's incarcerated. You could have an able conservative or an able, pro uh, an able progressive help your country. Many people would consider Thomas Jefferson an example that satisfies both. We need someone who has a clear world view that goes beyond their own lust for power. The reason that Ron Paul is willing to say things that will get him booed on stage that may be a decade or maybe next year when people finally say, oh, you know what? That wasn't so far out. 
um, is because he has a clear philosophy. He is in this because of his philosophy, not because of his lust for power. He may want attention like we all do, but fundamentally his philosophy has kept him from making all sorts of mistakes. Part of that philosophy is being a real Christian, in my opinion. And to be a real Christian isn't that different from being a pious person of any faith or even an ethical person who's agnostic or atheist, a highly principled person, because he said, we should treat others the way they wish to treat us. And I can't think of any world faith that doesn't fundamentally embrace that concept. Yet none of our leaders seem to be willing to do so. In my opinion, and I worked very hard to get Barack Obama elected, just on YouTube alone, I got 48,000 views, I think, on Obama, pro-Obama material. I'm extremely disappointed with Obama. Extremely disappointed is an understatement. Obama, you know, I'm sorry, Barack Obama, but I have to say that you are either a coward, you're corrupt, or you're being blackmailed, or they slipped something in your drink and changed your brain around on Air Force One. You've sold out or compromised on nearly every initiative. Those initiatives that we can't say you sold out or compromised on weren't very well constructed. In other words, in business, they wouldn't have even flown. From a liberal left perspective, his only achievements that are notable were the pre-existing condition clause in the medical care bill. How long do you think it'll take for the insurance and medical companies to make an end run around that? You cannot set up a yes-no flag in shaping policy, economic policy. You have to have a curve. A curve means everyone's affected by it, but no one is, puna, uh, is, is, is attacked specifically. Um, so no one can really get around it, but nobody's completely creamed by it. It's a formula. It's not a law. Economics, to make it work, it needs to be on a curve. And this is a long discussion that we can't have right now. But I think a lot of people can understand that. How long do you think it will take for these guys to get around it? In the case of the stimulus, we could have simply created $1,070,000 small business loans. We could have given a million Americans, roughly one in every hundred workers, a $70,000 small business loan, uh, which would have done 10 to 100 times as much stimulus, as well as built a whole new generation of small businesses. Now, I'm not saying we should go out and do this. I'm saying that compared to what we did, uh, this could have been done. And, but instead, they picked favorites. They set up scoring systems. They didn't look at curves. I submitted a stimulus application. I submitted four. None of them were funded because they were deemed incomplete. Even though I charged the government $3 per potential internet user to provide the state of California with internet, three bucks. And they funded people that were charging the government 3000 or 10000 per user. Let's be fair and say on average 500 per user. They funded fiber projects Fiber is like huge fire hoses that didn't even need to exist. There's no econ uh, They just funded things they liked. And if we look at the example, I hate to use the example of Solyndra, but that gives you an idea of what we ended up with. Nothing. Shite. In my industry, more money was made yeah, by the grant writers and the consultants than actually on the stimulus. In other words, small businesses spent fifty to hundred thousand dollars each investing in grant writers, analysts, consultants to get their proposals to government spec and a hundred of them failed for every one that uh, succeeded so I bet in broadband wireless or, or let's just say internet companies more was spent on applying for stimulus than was received from stimulus if you take out maybe the top ten proposals and I've seen proposals that were so easy to rig that you could basically milk the government to create a um, Ponzi scheme to move the money between a government actor and a private actor. So you could never even tell 
if they were making money or not because you could take all the losses and just build a government for it because they were private public partnerships and this is again beyond the scope of my talk tonight We need to focus on one problem, and one problem only for the next four years. Forget about all of the crap they're hurling at Ron Paul. It's all totally irrelevant. The one problem we have is this swamp called the uh, military-industrial complex, the correctional system, the war on terror, homeland security, CIA, NSA. If you work for these institutions, I'm sure you're a competent and good person, but you need to get a job doing something that actually produces wealth. If you're smart and you're well-trained and the economy shifts, you'll be fine. You may not know this, but I calculated that for each life we save on the war and terror, it costs us $108 million because the amount of lives at risk per year from terrorism around 6,500 a year. And we spend around $2 trillion a year on protecting ourselves from criminals and terrorists. Now, we have 2.4 million people a year who die just dealing with death, not dealing with the misery of poverty and poor education, just dealing with death. At $108 million per person you save the life of in the war on terror, uh, you could save the lives of 2,000 people from car accidents, suicide, heart disease, uh, obesity, lack of exercise, smoking. We are killing 2,000 people for every person that we save the life of on the war of terror. That's just a hard fact. Now, of course, you'd have to take that money and spend it on, on uh, prevention of those problems. But you can, if you give people better education and you put that money back into a regular economy where it can be invested, the secondary effect is that a lot of those people will be uh, have healthier lives and they'll die, they'll live longer because if you have access to clean food and clean air and clean water and you have some security about your housing and your medical care and your education you are going to be a healthier person people that are more prosperous are healthier people that are poor have a tendency towards more obesity the more toxic you make the environment for poor people and by pouring all the money into corrections and military and court systems and war on terror the war on drugs you're guaranteeing that you're going to create blight all over the country because you can't pay for everything it's obvious we have a debt of 15 trillion dollars the debt payments on the war on terror are 500 billion a year. We have overspent by trillions and trillions on military expansionism. We represent half of all military spending in the entire world. So it's tough. That money spent on education for one life saved in the war on terror could provide college educations for 1,000 people. And the fact is, if you ended the war of terror, you might not even have any terrorism-related deaths. Because the whole thing is a misguided understanding of Israeli Arab politics. Arabs will not come here and kill us if we stop meddling in their affairs overseas. They have, there's nothing in the Quran that says, go to North America and kill Americans. Nothing in the Quran that, uh, if they were, just to play devil's advocate, going to go out and have a jihad where they needed to convert Christians, it would be on the border states of the Arab states. It would be in perhaps Spain or in Yugoslavia or Italy. It certainly wouldn't be in North America. This whole thing is just a big scam to make people rich um, and to uh, uh, impose this concept of American exceptionalism. We have one of the lowest education rates in the industrialized world. How is that American exceptionalism? We have one of the highest debts in the world. How is that American exceptionalism? We are greedy, We are happily giving away every single right we have to the Patriot Act and SB 1867. We spent 400 years uh, fighting, sweating, bleeding, and dying to get these rights. And we've auctioned them all off in October of 2001 for nothing. How is that exceptionalism? We need to get our act together. And there's only one uncorrupt politician, and that's Ron Paul.
We need to focus on dismantling the secret government that grew up after World War II. It had its time and its place in the Cold War against the Soviet Union, but it created a government within a government because we couldn't allow it to be penetrated by moles. You had people like um, J. Edgar Hoover, who everyone is afraid to fire, who had blackmail files on every politician, who uh, was quite happy that JFK was killed, quite happy that RFK was killed. Who killed?